throughout the country, 90 percent of cities, states are going to go bankrupt within the next five years and probably many of them sooner. Hi, I'm Tim Cavanaugh from Reason TV. We're here with former Los Angeles Mayor Richard Reardon. Your Honor, thanks for joining us. Oh, thanks for having me. You've been uh, hitting the, the streets a lot and uh, publishing op-eds and uh, making the argument that um, municipal bankruptcy might be the way forward for cities such as Los Angeles and maybe specifically for Los Angeles. Can you elaborate on why that would help a city in distress? Well, uh, right now, the pensions that the city of Los Angeles has to pay every year go up about $500 million a year. And this year, they just barely got by. Next year, they're going to have to come up with an additional $500 million. And I don't know where they're going to get it. They've stolen from every nook and cranny of the, uh, the city. And if they get it next year, by some miracle, they won't get it the year after. So I, my prediction is they're what one of two things are going to happen. One is that they're going to have to come up with a restructuring of the whole pension plan and everything in the city or go bankrupt. The, the second thing is they've got, you've got to get the unions involved. And the first, I should say, the first thing that's going to happen is that people will stop buying L.A bonds from the city. The state's in worse shape than the city, and my prediction is that next year, come July 1st, they will not be able to sell any bonds, what they call a revenue anticipation bonds, to cover the next year. I don't think they'll be able to sell them, because nobody knows where they're going to have the revenues to pay them off. And there's, isn't there an additional complication by the uh, federal cancellation of the Buy American bonds that were in, designed to encourage uh, buying of municipal debt? Yeah, there is. I mean, every, all of a sudden it's come to a screeching halt just in the last two months. I've been predicting it for two years now, and I sold all the bonds I had in government uh, uh, because of it. And all of a, everything has stayed pretty even on it. But all of a sudden, the last two months, there's been a total crisis of selling these bonds. The cost to the city of L.A., almost the cost of their bonds for the one-year bonds went up about 50% in the last year. Okay, and that's a pretty good uh, indication that uh, there's not a lot of uh, credit being given to the, there's not well, a lot of confidence. Well, not a lot of credit, but also a big indication is that people may be afraid to buy those bonds. Right. In the case of, of bankruptcies, we've had two fairly recent ones in California. There was Orange County in the early 90s and uh, Vallejo in 2008. In both of those cases, the uh, the municipality and the county did not get out of their their public sector pension liabilities, which was the real issue. Chapter nine bankruptcy, which is what municipalities will go into, allows specifically for these contracts to be canceled. So why has no politician had the will to do that yet? Because they're elected by the unions in Vallejo, in the state of California, even in Orange County. The unions put more money into elections of politicians than the biggest corporations in the world. And because of that, you go in like Vallejo, they had to make some changes in the, particularly the uh, police pensions up there. And the, the police held out forever, even though the firefighters made a deal with the uh, city. And ultimately, the police union uh, won out, and the politicians were afraid to go ahead without it. So what's going to happen? They're going to face the same problem in another year or two. Mayor Antonio Villaraigosa just uh, recently uh, broke from pattern. Certainly, uh, he's a longtime union supporter and uh, teachers union member. Uh, and yet he uh, has recently been thumping the tub, saying that the teachers are in the way of reform. and. Uh, what does that mean? What does that do you? Well, you know, it's curious because I've been out there in the articles I've had in the Wall Street Journal, New York Times, and others, very critical of Mayor Villaraigosa, particularly on the pensions and the future, and a lot of other issues like closing the libraries and weekends and at nights. And then he comes up with this incredibly great talk 
blaming the unions for the, our poor education system. And I said, hallelujah, I'm going to forget everything I didn't like about him, and I think he's the greatest mayor that ever lived now. <laughs> Educating children so they have the tools to compete in a high-tech society in the future is the best thing, not only for the children, but for the country because we can't compete with other countries. We don't have the young people who can do the high-tech jobs that the in, in India they can do, China they can do, Malaysia they can do. Can you tell us a little bit about your own uh, experience as a private sector person in the charter school business and, the, and so forth? You know, I, I sound important, more, more important than I deserve, but I, the Alliance for Charter Schools, which has 18 charter schools, the average they do is about 40 or 50 percent than the schools the kids came from. They do over 800 a APIs. Uh, and it was founded in 1988 by Helen Bernstein and myself. And Helen was a former head of the teachers union who got religion on reform. And we started uh, with the Alliance a program called LEARN which was to get more power down at the local school level with the teachers and the parents and everybody. That worked. It didn't work extremely well. It improved things by maybe 8%. Uh, and then while I was mayor, uh, Frank Baxter took over as chairman of the alliance, and the laws were put through Sacramento allowing for charter schools. So Frank uh, changed the emphasis of the alliance to charter schools. And since then, let's say we formed 18 charter schools at the Alliance. I took over for Frank when he became, uh, after I was mayor and he became ambassador to Uruguay. Uh, and he did a great job. Alliance did a great job. We built a great board of directors. Some of our schools do over 900 API. Uh, the vast, vast majority, well over 90% go to four-year colleges of kids, and 95% of the kids are below poverty. They do much better than Beverly Hills or San Marino or any of those communities. And then last September, uh, I got a call saying that ICEF, which is a group of about 15 charter schools, which is fantastic scholastically. Virtually every student is African American. Over 90% of the students end up going to four-year colleges. And uh, that I got a call saying they're about to close because they've run out of money. And what happened is what I call the perfect storm happening at a time when the state had cut down on the money that went into education and therefore the cash flow to the school had gone down dramatically uh, add to that to that uh, the fact that the uh, ICEP grew too fast and they put a lot of their operation money into building new schools plus the fact that they just did some stupid things economically they had run out of money so about three days before the Friday we had to uh, they were going to close uh, Mike Piskel who founded ICEF and is to me as a saint he was a terrible manager but a saint uh, came to me begging to see if I could do something because he had been to the Gates Foundation, the Walton Foundation, uh, a number of other big foundations, and they had seen, they, did, they said, we don't want to give money down a dark hole, of a, something that's going under. He came to me and clicked my mind. I say two things. One, uh, I can't believe letting these kids go back to schools where only 4% of the kids are going to four-year colleges compared to ICEF that was 90%. And secondly, if ICEF failed, it would reflect on every charter school. It would really hurt the charter school movement. So I said, anything I can do, we should do it, and we should do it now. So with three days to go, we raised $3 million to keep the school going that month. S since then, we've gotten that up to uh, over $10.5 million, where we were able to pay those months, and we have enough to get us through December. We need to raise another two million for January. And once we're through January, the school will be able to go on its own two feet. And I, I'll maybe if you're interested, I'll tell you why. But the bottom line is they will be able to stand on their own two feet. What's fundraising uh, environment like these days? Well, it's, it's very, very tough. I mean, it's a, a lot of the uh, people that I usually rely on uh, said no. 
And I think it's sort of an experience. I mean, I grew up as a lawyer. I did a lot of uh, you know, near-type bankruptcy work uh, for sick companies. And the one thing you ever really learned is don't put money into a sick company unless they have a total, complete change of management and thing because they will figure some way to lose that money that you sure. give them. And I think a lot of the really great foundations uh, thought that way. And they said, we're not going to give you any money. You come back a few months from now and prove that you can stand on your own two feet. Well, we needed money in the meantime. And so it was tough, but I, I, I went out. Eli Broad has come up, came up with uh, two million, which will most of which will come in in December, and uh, the um, Otis Booth Foundation came up with two million. I came up with two million myself, and a whole bunch of other angels like the Gates Foundation gave a few hundred thousand, and uh, so we are, you know, we're getting there. How receptive has the Viragosa administration been to charter schools? Well, they've been mixed. The Viragosa was uh, very mixed until he gave that speech and he realized, you know, he has taken over, uh, they call it the mayor's partnership. He finally woke up to the fact that the reason it wasn't competing with ISEF or uh, the alliance is the union. <laughs> the unions getting, the unions do not want any accountability they put incompetent adults ahead of children. Yeah, that's the way it works in my family, too. Um, <laughs> the, uh, the Democrats have uh, shown some, some pretty broad disenchantment with teachers unions and public sector unions in particular of late. And, and you know, that go, starting with Governor Brown, Governor-elect Brown. What does this mean when you have this broad consensus among the Republicans and the Democrats and the, the people that these organizations are really taking up too much of our money, standing in the way of reform, and yet nothing changes? I wouldn't call it a broad consensus yet because clearly if you take like Sacramento, the legislature there is still overwhelmingly controlled by the unions. But there's been a you know, break in the ice for it, like Viragosa coming in, Obama, through Arne Duncan, uh, the race to the top has come in. Uh, people think that uh, Governor Brown may come in. He had charter school that he supported in uh, Oakland. Uh, but the legislators are all there. They're elected because of the unions. They're afraid to vote against the unions. But I'm hoping that what Viragosa did could be the atomic bomb that will wake everybody up, particularly poor people, and say, my child has a right to go to college. My child has a right to upward mobility to be anything they want. I don't want this kind of education. So talk a little more about the, the city and its finances. Um, a lot of folks on the left will say that the problem with LA, with California, with the United States is that the rich are not paying their fair share in taxes. Is that it, it, it is the problem that we, could we solve our financial problems by taxing the rich more? Well, the answer is absolutely not. And I'm I'm a rich guy, so I can you know I live extremely well. Uh, I do give well over half of my wealth to charities, and particularly for anything dealing with poor children. Uh, and a lot of rich people do that. Eli Broad, you look what he uh, he's done. Even Bill Gates, who. Uh, has has done it, but the it's an interesting problem that people don't understand. They don't want to. A lot of people is the gap between the rich and the poor has grown every year since 1970, and I think it's growing faster now with technology. The wealthy people like myself control the companies that you know build technology, and that I think gap is going to get bigger and bigger and bigger. And unless we educate kids to be able to be executives, top employees, and everything in high technology, those kids are going to have nowhere to go. Ten years from now, they'll be poor, they'll be out of job, and they'll probably be revolting unless we figure out some way to uh, solve the problem. You cannot solve the problem by saying, okay, we're going to redistribute, because raising taxes is a way of redistributing, redistributing the wealth. Every place in the world that's ever tried that has been a dismal failure. 
You look at England in the 50s, they had a brain drain where the wealthy moved, including the Beatles, moved out of the country. And by the end of the 50s, England was bankrupt. Margaret Thatcher saved them in that uh, time. And you saw Chile under Allende. I mean, God, he, within a year, he like doubled the income of the poor. And within a year, the whole country was bankrupt. In the case of L.A., what would be a smarter tax policy? What could we do in the way we collect taxes in L.A. to, to make the city more competitive? I think you asked the wrong question, is how do you make the city more competitive is the right question. And you do it by having a city with bureaucrats and the, the uh, city council, the mayor, being friendly to business. And we have, since I left office, uh, we have become less and less friendly to business. The bureaucrats take over. You talk to small businesses or any business, it takes them forever to get permits to start a business in L.A. Who wants to start a business in Los Angeles? Forget the amount of taxes. Being a wealthy guy, I don't mind paying more taxes if they're going to do the right thing. But I don't know, if you ever heard of uh, C. Northcote or Parkinson? Yes, yeah. He had a magic thing. If the total taxes go over 25%, a lot of bad things happen. The rich can, right now in this uh, internet age, rich can run their company from any place in the world. They don't have to be in California. They don't have to be in the United States. And you make the taxes at a certain point up there, that's what they're doing. Now, to a great extent, they're doing it anyway because California, and particularly L.A., are unfriendly to business. And we haven't created an infrastructure, we haven't done virtually nothing for an infrastructure in the last 30 years. And a lot of companies have left. They've expanded. How many Apple and uh, Intel, uh, other companies have expanded outside of uh, the United States or at least outside of California? Uh, let's speak a little bit. You're talking about infrastructure. Um, I, it just took me about an hour to drive over here uh, from Hollywood. How important is mobility to a city like LA, and how much is the the you know the fairly grueling experience of of being on the roads in LA depressing the city's future? I mean, certainly in, in deciding whether you're going to locate a business or expand a business, LA uh, traffic is an important ingredient. And uh, I think it's got to be improved, but how much you can improve a city this size, I don't know. You have the city council control the entitlements to build new buildings, uh, you know, zoning. And um, they, each councilman essentially is a dictator because if, if the other councilmen don't vote for what they want in their district, you won't vote for them in their other district. So essentially the, the big developers are getting permits to build all these big new condo buildings and everything in areas that shouldn't have, we don't want anybody else living there because it just brings more and more traffic. It gets awfully complicated because, you know, the developers don't make money by putting things in the inner city. You know, right. there is some public housing that goes there at some astronomical cost, which doesn't make much sense. And you also, complicated thing is you see a lot of gentrifying of the inner city, so you're pushing, like the number of blacks in LA has been reduced by, I don't know, it's almost 50% in the last 20 years. So it's very complicated. I don't claim to be able to see through walls and predict where we're gonna be next year or ten, two or 10 years after, but I'll tell you, as a leader, whoever is in a leadership role ought to be studying this and bringing on the smartest people in the world to help them. Are the smartest people in the world really gonna, gonna solve the problem that we're talking about right here. Let's let's take South LA, where there are a ton of programs that, that stem from the time of the riots and, and areas like Marlton Square and the Vermont Manchester Project and uh, there's some, you know, Broadway, uh, I forget what the cross street is. A lot of huge projects that are fallow to this day. Everybody has looked at them, everybody has come in with these big plans, the CRA has always been involved. And year after year, they continue to produce literally nothing but prairie land in the middle of Los Angeles. Why is that? 
wouldn't it be better just to to say let's let's divide all of this up into a few hundred little lots, sell it to whoever wants to buy it and build a house? Well, clearly things like that would definitely be the answer. Uh, one of the problems, I mean, it's a problem. It's it's a fact is a lot of that land is in the hands of very wealthy people. And they are looking for some magical way that they can make an awful lot more money uh, off projects, particularly by getting government money involved, et cetera. Now, under my administration, we came up with a program called Genesis, which was to try to get the private sector, not public money, but get the private sector into the inner cities and not handcuff them by saying, oh, you have to hire half your employees from the inner city or this, that, and the other. Just do what makes money for everybody because the inner city needs, they need better grocery stores and things like that there. But the way to get it is not through what I call poverty pimps, but through people that know how to make money and will make money there. And Genesis has done a great, great job. They've actually expanded throughout the country. They've got several billion dollars of developments, and it's improved. Actually, the work they've done has improved it in L.A. as well as other cities. Personal question. You, uh, you're a friend of uh, the uh, legendary comedian Jonathan Winters? Yeah, he's a great friend. Has he told you any good jokes lately, anything uh, on point? Well, uh, I'm wondering <laughs> if he, uh, you know, he's a little crazy sometimes, and uh, he is still going strong. And he, he is, uh, there's a uh, drugstore and cafe that are all in one business in uh, Montecito that he stays out at. And some he's done some outrageous things there, like uh, some woman comes in, uh, into the drugstore with her husband and says, oh, you're Jonathan Winters. And, he said, no, ma'am, no, I'm uh, Dr. Seymour Hirsch. I'm head of the uh, Santa Barbara Health Institute. He said, no, no, you look just like Jonathan Winter. Well, no, ma'am, I appreciate that. And he said, is that your husband over there? Oh, yeah, that's my husband. You know, he has a terminal disease. <laughs> and that, but his craziness, he won't let go. It's, it's funny for a second. But <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, so one more thing on uh, mobility before we get off that. Uh, we're in L.A. where... Uh, there is the Expo line, Exposition line is going to run from USC, I think, all the, maybe all the way to the beach. Hopefully. At, at street level, it's a, it's a street grade uh, train. Now we have this new multi-bazillion dollar plan for the uh, subway, t not to the sea, but the subway to the VA uh, hospital. And so when is LA going to get over its uh, train fantasy? Well, it is a fantasy, I, although the, the, the line to the beach on Exposition makes pretty good economic sense because it's infinitely cheaper than a subway. When, uh, the, uh, let me back off. When I was mayor, we went down with Xavier Arslowski, Von Burke, and myself went down to uh, Corchiba, Brazil, southern Brazil, uh, where the previous mayor of the city and then uh, the governor of the, of the province it's in, uh, Jaime Lerner, was a Polish Jewish guy whose family came over in the 1920s to Brazil. They'd, and they'd been there for years and uh, was an architect. He was a trained architect. And then his successor, I think it was Tang, Tang, Tanguchi or something, it was Japanese, the same that come over in the 1930s, was an architect. And they designed, to me, the best designed city in the world per dollar, because it wasn't fancy at all. But they had everything coming into the middle of the city in rungs. Those rungs were uh, dedicated bus lanes where they had tri-articulated buses, with, which can be doubled and everything, with about 250 people they took that took off every 70, 70 seconds from the center and went off one of those spokes. The only high-rises could be along the, the, uh, the bus lanes and no place else. And they also had like uh, uh, things that looked like uh, lighthouses in there, all the parks to show where the parks were. So what we did, we came back and we copied what they did in the valley. We have a 15-mile bus lane there that costs about 3% of what the subway will per mile. And it, it carry a lot more because... This is the orange line? The orange line. Because what happens is the di you have only a 70-second difference between one bus and the other. 
And with subways, you have about a 10 or 15 minute difference. Even though the subway goes faster, you can't take more people. And the one going to the beach or to uh, the VA is crazy. And I don't think it's ever going to happen. I mean, among other things, you you got to compete with uh, Beverly Hills and, you know, Santa Monica is somewhere along in it. And uh, I don't, even if it's built by some magic at some astronomical price, I don't think it's going to do that much. Do you have any hope for California as a sort of test case, as this kind of Keynesian interventionist laboratory where we have everything? The Democrats are in control. The Republicans have been extinguished. The threshold for raising taxes has been lowered. The... Uh, Every really every aspect of human behavior has some regulation over it. There are a million environmental regulations. There's a high-speed yeah. rail effort. So how's that all going to end up? Well, I think the total collapse unless something's done. Now, what's going to happen? Not just to California. It's going to happen more in California and others, but throughout the country. Ninety percent of cities, states are going to go bankrupt within the next five years, and probably many of them sooner. The big thing is they won't be able to sell, raise money by selling bonds. Nobody wants to lend them money. So the federal government, if Obama wants to get reelected, he's going to face some part of this, because some of it will happen before 2012, and you'll have total disarray. The parks will be closed. The libraries will be closed. They'll cut down 25% or more on the number of police, and it'll be... a total collapse. And one thing, the Obama administration has not focused on this. What's your assessment of Governor Schwarzenegger? Uh, do you know, <laughs> he and I, you know, I love the guy, but God, for, you know, he won't play golf with me anymore. Uh, why won't the governor play golf with you? I've heard about this. Can I be totally honest with you? Yeah. You're not going to repeat this to your wife or anything? No, absolutely not. Would you play golf with any somebody who cheats on the scorecard on almost every other hole, would you? No, I wouldn't. Would you play golf with somebody who hits the ball in the woods and it mysteriously ends up in the middle of the fairway, would you? No, 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 of course not. Well, neither will Arnold. <laughs> uh, what uh, do I think well, of I Arnold? Hope, I appreciate you coming clean on that. <laughs> Arnold is, uh, you know, he's a good friend of mine, although we've had differences recently on... Uh, some of the uh, bonds and things that they wanted to do. Like I can't, last a year ago, May, I w was chairman against voting for all the uh, lottery and all this money they were going to steal. Uh, but uh, Arnold is a extremely brilliant, obviously very charismatic, and um, uh, a real doer. And I saw him in private life that way, helping inner city causes. He didn't just pay lip service. He would do it, get it done. He got up into Sacramento where he had all these great ideas and you had a legislature that was controlled by the unions. So if you wanted to do things on education, the union stopped you. And uh, and then he had to make some peace with the unions, and then the Republicans would stop him. And I shouldn't say I feel sorry for him, but because uh, I don't think he feels sorry for himself. I will say, you know, I was Secretary of Education up there for a while, and there were a few things that I would like to have seen done that maybe the governor could do. You go back into the city of L.A. where when I was uh, mayor, it was called a very weak mayoral system. And although I got a new charter into place my second term, which made it a little stronger. But the bottom line is, if you have perceived power as mayor, then just use it. Don't let anybody, and don't wait for questions as to whether you have the legal or other right to do it. Mm -hmm. if, you, if you have, if people perceive you have that power, and if what you're doing is ethical and practical, just do it. Like you've heard the saying, it's much easier to get forgiveness than to get permission. You t let's take the uh, earthquake, Northridge earthquake. Literally, I had zero power that then legally because the state constitution provided in emergencies that the county would take over. But I acted like I had all the power. The county never questioned me. The state never questioned me. The federal government never questioned me. 
Uh, the county, I mean, did they even know there was an earthquake? Uh, <laughs> Welcome. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I mean that's that's surprising to me that uh, I would have thought I I had never studied how the the you know emergency powers were vested, but uh, I would assume that it would go to the mayor, not the county, which has no executive. And all yeah, it would yeah. it would make sense, but, right? Uh, yeah. How about uh, uh, Villaraigosa? What uh, do you have any thoughts on? I mean, other than ter turning on the unions. Well, right now he's on my A list because of sure, I, right, turning on, and I've talked to a lot of the leaders in town business leaders who are reformists on education and all of a sudden they're in love with Viragosa because he could be the, the 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 nuclear bomb to really destroy help us start destroying the power of these unions where they say they put incompetent people ahead of children they want no accountability so I say all the things I've been critical of Viragosa on uh, I'm just clear out of my mind now. Right now, I'm hugging him, I'm kissing right. him, Fantastic. and I'm going to work with him. In fact, I, I'm meeting with him this afternoon on this whole subject. Uh, speaking of uh, forgiveness and permission, you've you've been divorced three times. You're you're still uh, listed as Roman Catholic. Are you practicing? Very much so. Yeah, and I'm on the Catholic uh, Archdiocese Educational Foundation and. So does the church bother about divorce anymore? I mean, I remember it being a big deal breaker. Well, they make it easier to uh, get back in the church. They do, but they don't, you know, approve of, you know, they don't like divorce. Um, and uh, interestingly enough, one of the girls I'm dating now was my first wife, the mother of my children, Jeannie. And uh, we get along very, very well. And she, much to my amazement, she doesn't remember all my bad things. She remembers my great sense of humor. <laughs> I have to very grudgingly admit, as a disgruntled uh, former LA Times staffer, that they have really done some important work in 2010. As you know, I mean, hardly anybody reads it anymore, but it still exercises an enormous amount of influence in local politics and in state politics. Where does the bias show up in the LA Times? Can you give me some examples of, if maybe from your own administration? Well, when I, I'm administration, they had, I was running for office, they had, there was a, um, uh, a reporter from a Dallas newspaper followed me around one day uh, from house to house, and I was in some house in L.A., and there was this woman in her 90s was there, and we sat down and chatted with the reporter. And, you know, finally she said uh, something like, uh, uh, you know, blacks are terrible. And uh, and my response was, well, you know, some of them are. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I wasn't going to come out and hit her in the nose or something. And so th this reporter uh, in a three page, three, her article's on three pages in the very back page near the end talks about this little capsule. The LA Times, the front page, A section and headlines, starts out with that and say, people accuse Reardon of racism. Now, it made me angry, and it's still, and I think about it. And they just, they were trying to find almost anything to, you know, there's no way a rich white Republican can care about the poor. <laughs> and, uh, but I will say that I've, I had, I've had Hundreds and hundreds of Democrats come up to me and say, I'm the first Republican I've ever voted for because I do care about poor kids. And to me, that was the most important goal as mayor was to help poor children. What was it like when you were, you were growing up? What, uh, what's your background? I went to a uh, you know, primary school, to kin kindergarten through second grade, where 50 percent of my classmates were black. And interestingly enough, compared, they were the equal of the whites. I mean, scholastically, and even though I lived in a uh, middle to upper middle class neighborhood on one side of the woods, on the other side were the blacks with these very poor housing. But, you know, they did well in school. We got along. I got along with their parents. They got along with mine. Although I thought 10 years later, I thought, you know, my, our parents never met. <laughs> each other. Yeah. But my parents who had, you know, average amount of bigotism at the time never once said anything.
Uh, one other thing on the LA Times, and is the bias that we're talking about, is it really uh, for, uh, on, uh, sometimes it's on particular politicians, but the overall kind of uh, momentum of the institution is always in favor of government in intervention and against any sort of private sector initiative. It, it, why is that? Especially since it's one of the few non-union papers in the country. Well, it really is union. I mean, the sense that uh, they give an awful lot not to be union. They pay up more than they should. Uh, and I think it's, well, obviously it's the average reporter is very liberal. And you have, you know, reporters that graduated from Columbia Journalism School and others tended to be, uh, their, their professors at the school were liberal, they tended to be very liberal, and it just cut through the whole system. And uh, after Otis Chandler came in and said, okay, we're gonna give power to the reporters and everything, everything changed. Where before, one person at the top could say, you're gonna put everything conservative in the newspaper. Do you think that, uh, that, that the paper actually lost some influence by doing that? Because it, it seems to me, I was a big, when I was there, I used to love their uh, archive system and just look and read these crazy editorials from back in the old days. And, uh, you know, it was the paper that made Nixon up until Otis came in. Now, yeah. Otis comes in, turns it into this nationally competitive paper, but actually kind of, in a lot of ways, reduced the influence of the paper. It's just another, com it's like, it's another thing behind the New York Times. Yeah, I think it, uh, it's a lot of things. The, uh, but I think particularly the conservatives in town are among the wealthier, generally, and... Uh, they stopped taking the LA Times. <laughs> you know, they lost a constituency. At minimum, they could have had more you know, right wing, left wing, or you know, give give both sides of the uh, equation. Now, the New York Times is worse than the LA Times that way, and even they're they're hurting now very badly. Let's uh, look back uh, since we're speaking about the uh, the institution of newspapers. To think back a little bit. You come in as mayor in 1993. Um, at the time, uh, nobody's on the internet. Riots have just happened. Uh, the entertainment, the LA Times, and the entertainment, m m you know, Goliaths are all uh, at the peak of their powers. You know, what, what, how would you stack up, you know, your own mayoralty against where LA is today? Of the world, and uh, that's what you're asking me because. You know, I can sound to say, well, I was the greatest mayor in the history of the world. And uh, if I had any brilliance, it was the ability to hire the best and the brightest people and to empower them. The word empowerment, very few politicians know how to empower other people. But if you empower people and you say, like I told my average staff, even right down to the middle or lower middle, when you come in to every morning, think, what can I do that, to make L.A. a better city? Not what's going to make the mayor look good or what I agree on. And by doing that, you attract better and better people around you because they say, oh, you're empowered. We can get things done. And we did. One, you know, we got tremendous things done. And particularly for business, I mean, getting down to where 95% of permitting could have been done on the Internet in five minutes. Uh, and the others within a less than, you know, two or three months where it might take years before. What happened with that, I mean, since then? You, you had mayors that didn't know how to empower people and essentially surround themselves with very mediocre uh, people. And I think what happens is the bureaucrats just sort of uh, drifted off in whatever direction they wanted. LA's political class, and it's all, and it's almost entirely Democratic at this point, is really, I mean, it, it's a south of the Mason-Dixon line level of politics in a way that I think would shock Americans <laughs> in other places. Is there any hope for, for uh, you know, just LA's political class and maybe specifically for the Republicans? Is there anything that can happen to kind of shake things up? You know, you would think so, that because usually, uh, you know, the Republicans go towards the middle, the Democrats go towards the middle, and uh, you get a pretty balanced type legislature, but it hasn't happened. It's gotten worse, as you point out. And where it's going to be, I don't know. But if there's disaster in the city, uh, is, are the politicians going to change? 
or the public going to realize we have to elect different people? I hope it's the latter. You had a privatization initiative when you were mayor. Maybe hasn't gone uh, too far since you've left office. Uh, what, what, what areas of uh, LA government are ripe for privatization? Well, I mean, you start out with that you have, uh, you know, ninety-nine percent of the elected officials in LA are were supported by the unions, and they're not about and privatizations to a great extent, would indicate that the unions are going to lose a lot of power. Uh, now, therefore, I don't feel great hope for the future. But with that, as the budget gets more and more trouble, some of the solutions may, the only solutions may be privatization. So they might do that just for that reason, to get out of going to, into bankruptcy, is like privatize the airport, the ports, other places like that. It's certainly, uh, with the way the public employees have just gobbled up every penny of taxes and everything in the country, it seems to me that it's about the only way out of this morass is to privatize. <laughs>